The assassination of President Abraham Lincoln is an event that is scarred into the American consciousness, with the names associated with the event, such as John Wilkes Booth and Ford's Theatre, instantly recognisable. But the assassination was planned to go even further, with Booth and his associates hoping to revive or at least avenge the Confederate cause. The plotters also planned to assassinate Vice President Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William Seward, thus eliminating the three highest office holders in America and decapitate the Union government. But Andrew Johnson's assassin got too drunk to carry out his mission, while Secretary of State Seward's assassin was nearly successful, being able to gain entry to Seward's home. Seward was stabbed repeatedly but protected from fatal injury by a protective splint he was wearing around his neck after being thrown from his carriage nine days earlier. Earlier. Seward's family and bodyguards were eventually able to overpower Seward's attacker. Thus, while Lincoln was dead, the rest of the government remained intact, and the Confederate cause was now extinct. Although now, the painful task of reconstruction would have to be carried out without Lincoln's guidance, and the course of history was changed forever. 20th US President James Garfield was shot in 1881 by an unstable man called Charles Guiteau. But Garfield didn't die immediately, as the bullet failed to strike any vital organs, but if it was not removed, it could turn septic and kill him. His doctors were unable to locate the bullet, so a novel solution was devised. Scottish-Canadian Alexander Graham Bell, credited with the invention of the telephone five years earlier, had now invented a type of metal detector. It was hoped that Bell could use this to find the bullet for the surgeons to remove and save the president's life. However, although the metal detector had worked previously, it was unable to locate the bullet, giving off confusing signals or none at all. Sadly, Garfield died 79 days after being shot and was succeeded by his vice president, Chester A. Arthur. The reasons for the failure of the metal detector are disputed. Some say the bullet was just too deep, while others say the doctors wrongly directed Bell to use the detector on Garfield's right side when the bullet was on the left, while others say the metal springs in Garfield's bed, one of the first to be fitted as such, interfere with the machine. Theodore Roosevelt is among the most iconic presidents, yet he was not originally meant to be president, instead inheriting the office on the death of President McKinley in 1901. In fact, Theodore Roosevelt was the first vice president who inherited the office who then went on to win election himself. President McKinley was shot in Buffalo, New York by anarchist Leon Chogosh, whilst meeting people and shaking hands. In fact, it was only after this assassination that the Secret Service was tasked with protecting the president. Roosevelt was unsure how to respond to the news of the shooting. At first, McKinley was expected to recover, and TR didn't want to be seen to be waiting on the president to die. So rather than wait in Buffalo, Roosevelt went hiking on Mount Marcy. But when Roosevelt was told McKinley wouldn't survive, he rushed to Buffalo. After McKinley died, Roosevelt was sworn in as president. Because it was such a hasty operation, Roosevelt was one of the few presidents not to swear the oath on the Bible. Roosevelt was originally made vice president as a way to contain his ambitions and progressive ideas. When he was made president, against the plans of conservative Republicans, Mark Hanna quipped, that damn cowboy is now president. Most of us alive today have only known presidential inaugurations happening without much variation between them with all recent inaugurations taking place in Washington DC and all since Ronald Reagan's first inauguration taking place on the west side of the Capitol building to allow more spectators. The most memorable exception to this rule is the first inauguration of Lyndon Johnson aboard Air Force One, albeit still on the ground at Lovefield, Texas after the assassination of John F. Kennedy. This inauguration is notable for a few exceptions to the norm of presidential inaugurations. Obviously, it was the first to be conducted on an airplane, and it was the first to take place in Texas. Also, instead of a Bible, Johnson swore the oath of office on a missile found by Kennedy's bedside. Since the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court was not close by, Johnson instead summoned Federal Justice Sarah T. Hughes, who was in Dallas and had a close personal relationship with Johnson at the time. This was also the first and only time that a woman has administered the oath of office. 